What we have here is an online tutorial and it's intended to provide you with some examples of how to go about analyzing the artwork you have chosen, what sort of ideas you may want to consider, what kind of questions do you want to ask yourself, as you contend with how power and domination is communicated in the context of colonialism or imperialism, terms which we are going to be considering as one and the same here. Now I'd like to start by addressing your paper topic. What it really comes down to is Edward Said's argument that colonialism imposed the superiority of the European way of life on that of a subjug subjugated territory, that it was as much a colonization of the mind and body as that of the land and the economy, right? And I, I really suggest that you really stop and think about this statement carefully. The words that are in here, right? Superiority, subjugated, colonization, this idea of colonizing the mind and the body, not just the land and the economic opportunities it provides. So in this topic, we're going to consider this further. What sort of contextual and more importantly, visual evidence can we detect in artwork that speaks to Said's characterization of colonialism? To put this more simply, how do people rationalize their sense of cultural, ethnic, or racial superiority? One of the things you might want to consider is how stereotypes or generalizations about others function. This is because stereotypes do a great job of robbing people of their individuality to instead reduce them down to superficial ideas. Also think about this. How do people use this perception of superiority to try to control others? For your paper, you'll be examining the answers to these questions, not only through the lens of colonialism, but how it connects to either race, gender, or culture depending on which work of art you selected to analyze. So when you write your paper and you evidence your argument, you will be looking at two points of evidence. One, contextual evidence, and two, visual evidence, things that you deem significant within the work of art. And don't forget, this will need to include somehow, in some way, a discussion of the artwork style and how it relates to this set of ideas. You will find it to be helpful contextual evidence or perhaps visual evidence or both, and all of this will do quite well in supporting your overall argument. Also, I want to encourage you, if you are unfamiliar with what exactly colonialism entails, to build that into your research. It's fundamental that you understand this concept to effectively defend your argument. Now we're going to start out with an image that is addressing the topic of colonial superiority regarding race and culture. What we have here is one of the masterpieces of self-congratulatory Napoleonic painting, Napoleon at the Plague House at Jaffa, which was commissioned by the Emperor Napoleon of France in 1804, the year after he crowned himself emperor. This was a painting that commemorated event after the fact, a documentation. And I'm making quote marks with my hands right now when I say the word documentation. And this documented his 1799 campaign in Syria. He was not yet emperor at this time. He was just a general. And he had led a campaign into Egypt and Syria to take control of this region as a means to supposedly defend France's trade interests. While this venture ultimately failed, it did have some initial success, which is what is being alluded to in this image. The whole thing was a sort of PR nightmare for Napoleon. First of all, the taking of Jaffa was exceedingly violent. For two days and two nights straight, there was pretty much widespread carnage. 4,500 prisoners were shot or beheaded during this short time. According to my calculations, and take caution, this is not a historian doing math here, this would equate to about two people being killed every minute over this relatively brief period of time. Other issue, and this is really what's being addressed here, is there was a problematic accusation on the part of the British that Napoleon had planned to similar, summarily execute members of the French troops who had contracted the plague. 
So these people are fighting for their country. They become ill. Napoleon doesn't want to deal with it. He's just going to kill him. Now, obviously, this wouldn't really go over well with the French public. That these men are risking their lives for their country. And they're being treated in this really inhumane way. Being treated really as expendable. I personally think this is gross. So this painting was in part a propaganda piece that tried to show that Napoleon was doing the opposite. Not only was he just like, you know, killing people, he was there visiting them. He was supporting them. Pretty much everyone, historians and art historians, agree that this scene was fictitious, that this never happened. Now, of course, this is pretty interesting considering the timing. This painting was made the year after Napoleon became emperor of a country that had just had a revolution that had sent the previous king and his queen, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, to the guillotine. So he would definitely want to make sure that he retains the support of the French people. Now that we have the context out of the way, let's consider the implications of what we're actually looking at here by considering a detail of the painting, and that would be Napoleon. We have more or less in the center of the painting the figure of Napoleon in his full military regalia, clearly a very decorated and therefore very powerful, successful military figure. This is a fabulous, jaunty sash. Love it. This is typical of Napoleonic painting, where he is depicted as the heroic center of attention, and he's definitely the hero here. He is visiting plague victims, who have been housed in this Islamic mosque that has been turned into a makeshift hospital. His level of bravery and concern for his soldiers really is unparalleled here. It is such that he is actually touching, as we can see here, an open sore of a plague victim, not even worried that he's going to contract the plague. Rather, it's as if his touch will somehow heal this poor unfortunate man. This is an act that has been likened to, and appropriately so, the biblical narrative of Jesus touching a leper. Take a minute to see if you could identify anything else that might support this interpretation of Napoleon trying to present himself pretty much as Jesus, which is a bold claim for sure. I think the dramatic light is one of the more significant points of support for this interpretation. We have this dramatic spotlight situation, which is emanating from an indiscriminate source. You kind of see it better in this view here. Could it be the light of God shining down on Napoleon? The light also could be a symbol for the power of Napoleon, his healing powers. Not necessarily literally, although that does seem to be suggested, but I would say more in a figurative sense that he can heal the struggles of his troops the struggles of a France that was fresh out of a pretty intense revolution. I'm also seeing as this idea that God is taking time out of his busy God schedule to look down and bless Napoleon's attempts to take control of this area of the Middle East. Now this idea of the presence of God is important as it relates to this paper topic. In terms of promoting colonial power and using this sense of superiority to justify this rationale, First, we have two religions that are set against each other, Christianity and Islam. Go back for a minute. Gross, the artist, has carefully detailed facets of Islamic architecture, which we see in the inclusion of the minaret back in here. And up in here, this is the sun. Yet, the light is functioning as an iconographical symbol of the Christian God. Here, Tri Christianity triumphs over Islam. Notice the French flag flying boldly in the background, symbolizing control over this region. Over here, we have Islamic doctors who work in the service of the French, tending to those stricken by the plague. And the light of God shines down on Napoleon, who more so than any other figure in this composition is projecting power and dominance. There are all sorts of things compositionally, that we can cite to argue how Gross presents Napoleon as dominant. And if we want to keep along the lines of iconographical analysis, which you know I always want to do, one of the more obvious symbolic references to power is this uniform. You don't just get a fancy decorated uniform like Napoleon's by sitting in a tent. 
at least not in theory. He did all sorts of brave things to earn that feather in his cap. And the impressive nature of this uniform is clearly contrasted against the nudity of the men who surround him, which we can see here and here. If you think about nudity from an iconographical standpoint, it represents weakness, vulnerability, submission. The message here, the justification, seems to be that there's a certain heroism that's tied to colonialism, a bravery in fighting this good fight and taking control of this land, which is a just moral undertaking that is endorsed by none other than God himself. Now, let's try to interpret this from a stylistic standpoint. Neoclassical images, they are rife with themes of heroism and virtue as subject matter. Even these nude men down here, dramatically positioned in these variations of the prone positions that are basically a rearticulation of the classical nude. Think back to all those Greek images of the dying warriors, especially this guy right here, and that dying Gallic trumpeter that we looked at in Art 200. Now in terms of style, I consider this a transitional one, that it contains both neoclassical features. Your book is kind of ambiguous on this point. I think we can all agree that this image contains a fair bit of visual drama, which is a feature that's both neoclassical and romantic. We have all this drama unfolding on a shallow stage-like space to really highlight the action of the scene, to really get the viewer emotionally invested, which is a neoclassical feature. Now here is where style is really important. This scene is imbued with a sense of mystery. There's a smoky, diffused light. It really is articulated well through the looser brushwork, which is more typical of the romantic style. Also, don't forget, typical of the romantic style, we have our obligatory inclusion of a man with no pants. There are people in here that are wearing foreign clothing that the French were unaccustomed to seeing. We also have unfamiliar racial types. And these unfamiliar images were well-documented points of fascination for the French. Now, why would all this mystery be so important to the sets of ideas that we are considering for this paper? Well, the West had this view that the East was this land that was barbaric, exotic, mysterious, uncivilized. Think about these words I'm using. Barbaric, uncivilized. Do these seem like positive words? I don't really think so. And here is where, again, this sense of cultural superiority comes into play. The intent of this painting now becomes apparent to highlight the cultural disparities between the East and the West. Right, that idea of polarities, which we know is really popular in neoclassicism, to show the French people that the East needs the presence of the French as this sort of civilizing, using quote marks because this language is problematic, a civilizing force needed to impose the right, quote marks here, the right way to dress and behave and worship and otherwise perform culture. I am also thinking about this idea of being uncivilized, quote marks, uncivilized, and wondering if it somehow directly connects to this subject matter of the plague. If the plague here operates as a metaphor for the East, and we know that romantic paintings love to use metaphors, love to use allegories, attempting to portray the East as this dangerous and unpredictable threat to the French, something that needs to be taken control of, diffused, eradicated, just like the plague. Now I chose this painting as our example of colonial power and perceptions of colonial superiority as it relates to gender. More specifically, how women, particularly their sexuality, fits into this ideology. Let's start out with some context. This painting was based off of a text called Histories, which was written in the 5th century by the Greek historian Herodotus. Now for me, this is already setting off warning bells. A lot of people love Herodotus as a significant primary source of research, but I have found that he has, in some instances, misrepresented ancient culture, particularly Mesopotamian cultural practices that relate to women. So I would argue that just because Herodotus is involved, 
doesn't necessarily grant legitimacy to what is being depicted in this image. Okay, I feel a lot better now that that's out of the way. Let's move on. This painting was displayed at the British Royal Academy Summer Exhibit 1875. It was wildly popular, and the following year it was sold for 6,000 guineas, which was the most money ever paid in the history of art to a living artist. In today's times, this would be approximately $200,000-ish. And I say ish because the inflation calculator only went back to 1913, not 1876. So, the painting clearly was popular, sold for a lot of money, and this is indicating that the British people are on board with the ideas that this painting is communicating. Now, full disclosure, there is an alternative interpretation of this painting out there that it was intended for a female audience to encourage them to consider the problematic nature of their own marriage market, which were these social gatherings where they would do something not too conceptually distinct from what we're seeing here. They'd put on fancy, alluring clothes to attract mates. Now, I'm uncomfortable with this alternative interpretation because I don't think it adequately addresses the intentionality of the artist. Why would he make such a painting? There are a lot of gaps in the argument, and this keeps me up at night. So we'll stick with the traditional interpretation that this image functions to underscore notions of colonial dominance and superiority, particularly as it relates to the relationship that the male colonizer had with the bodies of colonized women. And remember, Said is addressing this idea of bodies being colonized. Let's do an analysis of what we're seeing here that could be significant. First, this work of art has all sorts of imagery that appears very exotic, which would especially be the case to someone living in the conservative cons culture that was Victorian England. Where do we see this? Well, we see it in the surroundings themselves, these bright mosaic tiles on the wall, animal skins on the floor, belonging to species of animals that certainly were not indigenous to Britain, which we're seeing right down in here. Also similar to what we were seeing in the previous Napoleon painting, there's this sort of ethereal, mysterious, almost sultry light that seems to be emanating from some indiscriminate source, giving this sense that these foreign lands are enthrallingly mysterious places. This is complemented by colors used by Long, the artist, that are rich and luxurious and complemented by this, these like sensuous textures the smoothness of the women's skin, their garments that look so soft to the touch and are also so tantalizing in their slight transparency. So here, this exoticism is contextualized as sensual. And considering that the subject matter that we see here, marriage market, this should be setting off some warning bells that there's some problematic messaging going on here. Now let's talk about style. How can I support the visual analysis that I've just provided with style? Considering that this is a romantic painting, none of this should be too surprising. Romanticism was a literary style that was popular from approximately 1875 to 1830. It included exciting narratives of mysterious far-off lands that stimulated the imagination in pleasurable ways. And of course, this is being re-articulated in visual arts. Now, romanticism just didn't come out of nowhere. This is set against the backdrop of colonialism, global travel and expanded trade, all of which made people interested in the mysteries of far off lands. Also during this time, there were excavations that were occurring in what was formerly Mesopotamia. And remember that Babylonia, the site of the scene of this marriage market, was part of Mesopotamia. And these newly excavated artifacts were being displayed in London, giving people even more of this um, exposure to the history of Mesopotamia. There's definitely more to say about the Romantic style, but I don't want this lecture to be a spoiler alert. I want this to just provide here some information. I don't want to steal all your thunder as you do more research to further understand Romantic style and to contextualize your argument. Now, since the focus of this analysis in this painting is gender, let's limit our focus more or less to the women. We see them arranged in this long parallel line. 
that extends across the front of the picture plane. They're displayed almost like commodities for purchase, which is essentially what is happening. They are arranged in a long line that extends beyond the confines of the composition. Cut off here. Right? And that's to suggest that there are so many women for sale that not all of them can be depicted in the painting. We see in these women a variety of reactions to their situation. Some seem eager, some seem resigned to their fate, a few are visibly upset, which interestingly, that's minority. I know I would not be happy to be in this situation. Their status as a commodity is really emphasized by their passivity to this situation. They sit, and that removes their potential to be active. They're placed below the men who are back here in the background, who, by the way, are standing, which is a much more active presentation. They also seem to be placed below the eye level of the viewer, kind of down in here where our eye level is kind of right in here. And that also reinforces this sense of submissiveness. It seems to me that there really are two issues here. One, again, this idea of European cultural superiority. And two, a suggested general, a suggested general domination over the body of these women. So how does this relate to colonialism and these conceptions of European colonial superiority? First, according to Herodotus, it was the most beautiful women who were sold first. Well, take a look at these women really closely, each individual woman. As you can see, the women are arranged in a progression with the women on the far left up next for sale, right? She's up next. So these would be the most beautiful. And notice how the most beautiful, and I'm totally quote marks here, that the most beautiful have lighter skin and that the skin becomes darker, the facial features more diverse racially as we move down the row. Even this lady who's looking in the mirror, that light really shines to emphasize the lightness of her skin. And what this would be saying is, is that the European norms are the more beautiful, quote marks, more desirable, quote marks. Now in terms of these women's bodies, their sexuality, what this image is doing is it's fetishizing the East, presenting it as a construct that's tied to the se sexual objectification of the female population. Think of this idea of the male gaze, right? And if you are going to write your paper on gender and colonialism, do a little research on this idea of the male gaze, even just something as basic as looking online to see what this means. This idea of men who look at this image and how what's being depicted here might be something that's sexually appealing. That this might be a fantasy to be able to purchase this exotic foreign woman for whatever kind of sexual things you want to do. There's some very problematic implications in this. Remember this painting on the bottom, the large odalisk? It's the same exact set of ideas here. To be exotic, different from European cultural norms, this is being eroticized. And this similarity exists between these two paintings because as you know, this is a common feature of the romantic style. In both of these images, the sexuality of these women is attached to the fact that they are exotic, they are different. And this is a potential site onto which to project sexual fantasy. These women who wear the trappings of femininity, these trappings are decidedly Eastern. Clothing, the turban, the jewelry. In both cases, the sexuality depicted here, or at least intimated, is readily available for the visual consumption in the way that the bodies of these women are made available to the, the viewer who is presumably male, complements well stereotypes that existed about foreign women, that because they were not restricted to the proper, quote marks, cultural, moral, and religious restraints of proper, quote marks, British society, that they freely engaged in this like unchecked sexuality, that they had all these heightened sexual urges that were not restrained by the respectability of a civilized, quote marks, society.
Now, the painting that we see here, this is coming out of German Expressionism, which, like its French counterpart, the Fauves, was really trying to express intense emotion and to simultaneously incite that intense emotion within the viewer. The way they did this was through some pretty aggressive color contrasts and treating the human form in ways that were distorted, ragged, agitated. And again, this is something that is German, particularly with the style of Debrucke, not something we would see with the Fauves. The harsh angular treatment of form, at least in the way that the artist Ludwig Kirchner approached it, expressed this idea that the Debrucke artists had that industrialism had, in de had detrimental effects on society, that it fostered an impersonal society that made people feel lonely and alienated, which Kirshner reinforced by depicting these people here in this crowded tight space. But yet there's no real interaction. There is a sense of a psychological and a physical isolation, despite the fact they're so close together. And they are very close to us, the viewer, they do not acknowledge or interact with the viewer. And this might seem familiar to you. This is the same set of ideas expressed in the same set of ways that we saw over and over and over again with Impressionist painting. Now, this is a more of a challenging image for us to relate to the paper topic because it doesn't outright depict colonized people. So what is going to be really important here is style. And this is because Expressionism was strongly influenced by primitivism. Primitivism preceded this style, but its use as a mode of representation peaked with European Expressionism. Now again, if you're going to choose the um, Picasso example, you're going to want to look into primitivism. Do a little research. Again, it could be something like an internet search to really understand what this concept entails. Now, returning to this painting here, for Kirshner, he linked the modern urban existence to what he saw as the primitive, the savage, okay? Problematic. Think back to Gauguin, the post-impressionist. He was doing the same thing. Problematic. So what Kirshner believed was that under this thin veneer of civilization, that there were animalistic urges in all of us. And that increased competition for resources, which was what industrialization was causing, that this would unleash the beast in people. Now, with this in mind, I want to point out the modern, sophisticated urban people depicted here. The women actually are prostitutes, which creates a whole other angle for analysis that I am not even going to go into, although I really, really want to, because it's so problematic. But... Not going to do it. I'm going to stick with the focus here. We can see with the depiction of these people that their rendering is quite harsh. It's very abstract. It's very angular. Their form is treated very sharp. There's a crudeness to it. It's oversimplified. And here is where primitivism comes in. Their faces are mask-like. If we look at a detail of the faces, and compare them to these masks that were created in the Pacific Islands, we can see that there are some stylistic similarities. The elongation and the angular treatment of the face. The simple shapes that emphasize large flat planes of space. The abstraction of facial features. The reliance on line to suggest shadow and texture. German Expressionism, particularly de Brucke, was influenced by the art of the Pacific Islands and liberally appropriated their artistic expressions in these paintings. Part of the reason this was happening with increasing frequency during this time is that European countries were starting to open new types of museums, ethnographic institutions that displayed objects from other cultures, particularly those from Africa and Oceania, which the Pacific Islands is part of Oceania. They also displayed some Native American art and material culture as well. How was all of this stuff becoming available for display in Europe? Colonization. Can you see the problem here? Again, think about what a lot of these words I've been using mean. Primitive, barbaric, beast. 
These are not terms with positive connotations. And to convey these concepts, Kirshner is using imagery from another culture. Think about this. To talk about what's primitive, what's barbaric, what's beast-like, he takes other cultures' images and says, here's an example of that. Here's another question to consider. Beyond connecting concepts such as savage and primitive to other cultures' artistic expressions, why else might it be problematic to use other cultures' artistic expressions in the service of European modern art? And here is where the issue comes in. Instead of these facets of race, ethnicity, and culture being celebrated, instead of acknowledging that which identifies who this cohesive group of people truly are, these Pacific Islanders, these things are being trivialized. They are essentially being reduced down to interesting or entertaining or aesthetically pleasing images. Or in this case, this culture's artistic expressions are being reduced down to perpetuating super problematic stereotypes. What this does is this has the effect of delegitimizing cultural identity, robbing this culture of its significance and its autonomy. These details become more about what's trendy in the French public or what they think is interesting or what further is fueling their misunderstanding of other cultures rather than functioning as educatory, educating people about who the Pacific New Islanders are what their culture is like. Overall, lots of complicated but extremely important ideas to consider with this topic. Sounds challenging, but I know you can do this. Good luck on your paper. <laughs>